All right. So thanks for joining everyone to Tropal A Labs, what beekeepers need to know and how you can help. Uh, we're joined by Dr. Samuel Ramsey. Dr. Ramsey received his BS in entomology from Cornell University and his PhD in entomology from the University of Maryland College Park. He completed his postdoctoral training <clears throat> with Dr. Jay Evans and Dr. Steve Cook at the ARSB Research Laboratory. Um, Dr. Ramsey is celebrated as an engaging science communicator. He uses his talent to make science more accessible to a broad audience. Uh, Sammy, take it away. Thanks again. Wonderful. No, thank you. Uh, any opportunity that I get to inform people about this parasite, I, uh, I will take it because um, I really do think it's important for us to be aware of just how quickly these organisms can spread. And I'll tell you a, a bit about that now. So um, as Matt has already referenced, um, I, I did a fair amount of work at the United States Department of Agriculture, and that really allowed me the resources and the ability to um, conduct this work in different areas of the world. Now that I'm partnering also with National Geographic, um, it's it's just been a, a, um, a great set of circumstances for me to travel, see where this parasite currently is, and document its spread. Um, and I've compared it to being a lot like the pandemic. And so I'm going to jump right into that. Uh, when we think about all the issues that honeybees are dealing with, everything from pathogens, pesticides, climate change, habitat destruction, poor nutrition, and even human conflict, uh, it's important to recognize that there is no single thing that is killing our bees. We are in a multifactorial situation where multiple interacting factors are leading to death in our honeybees. But with all of the data compiled, uh, compiled in a large meta-analysis of understanding what's going on with our bees, we have come to the conclusion that parasites have the greatest impact on populations of honeybees. And that's actually not surprising. Parasites uh, are really fascinating organisms that learn how to manipulate another creature's biology such that they can exist in a way where they can extract as much resource as they like um, and, and just kind of benefit off of that creature while causing all kinds of issues. Now, normally evolution strikes a balance there and doesn't allow this creature to fully exploit its host or the host and the parasite die. But because this parasite started on a group of bees in Asia um, that over evolutionary time was able to strike a balance, now that it shifted over to Apis mellifera, that balance has been disrupted and they have the ability to exploit um, the honeybees and because we have put colonies so close together, even if they kill their host, they have another one right next to it. So there's no downside stopping them from being extremely virulent pathogens. Now, these organisms inside of honeybee colonies and associated with honeybee colonies have a special name. They're called melitophiles. When we find a set of organisms that has a very close association with eusocial insects, they get a special designation. Um, so the ones that are closely associated with ants are called myrmecophiles um, from the Greek for ant and phile for lover. And melitophiles means honey lover. But these parasites typically aren't that focused on honey. It's really the honey bee itself that brings uh, so much um, benefit to them existing in these colonies. And it's the fact that the colonies themselves are well, just chock full of food and incredibly, incredibly, incredibly uh, well refined for the existence of um, small insects and arachnids that they really want to be there. Um, it's perfectly climate controlled, perfectly temperature controlled. Uh, there's always a source of food and that's made them very attractive to interlopers that want to get in. Normally honeybees are good at keeping them out, but some creatures have slipped through. And the fact that we have not focused more attention on melitophiles as we understand honeybees uh, is something that is really costing us. And I'm glad to see um, that in recent years, that has really begun to change. So let's talk about this mysterious melitophile. There is an organism darting around on frames that you see before you. And this is a video uh, captured by Dr. Lilia de Guzman and her colleagues, um, I believe in Thailand, looking at these trophy mites all darting around. This is not sped up. This is Tropolelaps mercedesi, and it is an emerging threat to Western apiculture. Uh, a lot of the, the pictures and, and videos that you'll see in this video from this point forward uh, will be from my, uh, my work with uh, National Geographic. I'm part of the National Geographic Society, 
And as a result of that, have uh, been able to work with some incredible photographers. Uh, and we have one who travels with us consistently. And so the mite that you're looking at right there was just photographed two weeks ago uh, in Korea. Now, tropal elapsed mites have, were originally only found in just a small region of Southeast Asia, just a tiny little section of the world. And then they started spreading out more and more and more after they transitioned from their normal host, the giant honeybee, to their um, alternative host, now Apis mellifera, which has allowed them to move to all the different locations um, that you see on your screen right now. So after expanding out of Southeast Asia, they went into East Asia, into China and South Korea. They have not reached Japan at this point. Um, I've spent a bunch of time trying my best to verify that during my time there over the last few weeks. Um, but they've also moved into Oceania. So they're officially outside of Asia now that they're in Oceania. Um, they've also moved into, um, into the Middle East, uh, Iran, Afghanistan. Um, and most concerning to my mind right now are the fact that I've uh, now been able to verify um, samples from, um, um, these were from Tajikistan, um, but as we talked more with the beekeepers of Tajikistan, um, they've explained that these parasites, um, they think they came from Kazakhstan, they think the ones in Kazakhstan came from Russia, um, so we've started working with um, some researchers in Russia, um, talking with them more, and it's actually really concerning some of what we've been hearing as um, uh, some of the veterinarians and researchers there have told us, oh, yeah, we've had these for at least two, maybe three years. We think they arrived around 2020. Uh, and it's this particular region. So the areas where you see the red arrows are most recent additions um, where people have reported trophy mites, and I'm working to verify them now. Um, I won't be traveling to Russia anytime soon, but this uh, area of Central Asia here, I'm going to do my best to verify some of the samples there and have some sent to me from these other areas to, to verify their presence as well. But this is the most concerning, a recent report that these parasites are actually present on the border with Ukraine. Um, that's because that is currently a war zone. There are much more important things that people are focused on, focusing on right now. Uh, and that could allow for these parasites to slip unnoticed into that country, a country that exports honeybees to other regions of the world, um, including Canada. Um, which could be a concern for us here in the United States. Um, when I first started this research, um, this was the only map that I could find on tropy mites. And so this is a map from about 20 years ago um, showing where the tropy mites were at that time. And you can see that they've expanded their geographic range substantially to encompass Oceania, um, the Middle East, and now very likely Central Asia uh, and appear to be moving into um, Eastern Europe. And so um, the Ramsey Research Foundation has actually been tracking the spread of these organisms. Um, and we will be publishing this map soon with all the areas filled in where we've been able to verify them uh, in just, uh, hopefully, so we're supposed to be submitting that paper um, this month, but hopefully the peer review process will be quick enough that this information will be available before the end of the year. Now, what do we know about this parasite? We know that tropy mites are smaller than varroa mites. Um, in this image that we captured, you can see them like you know side by side, and you'll notice that they're uh, close to a third the width um, of a varroa mite. They're a little bit more than a third the width of a, a varroa mite. And because varroa mites are already hard to see themselves, that makes tropy fairly difficult to see when they're not moving. But the second they start darting around on a frame, you know you've got something odd there because they move unlike any of the parasites that we currently see. And it's these tropy mites that create concerns in directions that we just kind of aren't used to. Uh, the tropy mites feed on the bees um, the same way that varroa mites feed on the bees. Um, they will climb into a cell, they'll feed on the developing larva, they'll puncture a hole there and feed on the tissue underneath. But when varroa feeds, it opens a small hole um, in the bee, it keeps that same hole open and that localizes the damage that it causes to just one segment of the bee's body. Um, at least the external hole uh, is localized to just one segment. But the tropy mites feed um, on various locations on the bee's body. And so you can see in this larval bee up here in the left-hand uh, left corner of your screen, you can see all of those red 
marks there, those are from bites inflicted by trophy mites, and they continuously feed. Uh, this is only over the course of um, a, a few hours, but every time they feed, they seem to just go after a different section of the bee's body. They don't do that thing where they localize their feeding to a single area. That's important because the feeding that uh, happens seems to induce something like a reaction of scar tissue in that region, where as that bee grows up, certain regions of its body um, can be kind of kinked and unable to bend properly, move in the directions that they should be able to move. If this happens to an area destined to become a wing or destined to become an antenna, they may be impaired in their ability to fly, impaired in their ability to move their antenna um, with the normal fluid motions that you typically see in healthy bees. And we also know that these Parasites grow very quickly in terms of their population size. While a population of varroa mites can double its population size every 30 days, we know that a population of trophy mites seems to be able to double its population size in a much shorter period of time than that. It seems like uh, just every couple of weeks, their population size can double uh, potentially less time than that, around 10 days. And that is concerning. One of the reasons that they're able to do this is because they don't spend nearly as much time outside of their reproductive phase as varroa mites do. Varroa mites need to pull a set of proteins out of the adult fat body tissue as well as the fat body tissue in juvenile bees. There are some different proteins in both of them. Um, and so the vitiligenins that they're trying to pull out are, are one thing, but there are also hexamarins that they're extracting and those have differential levels in the adult bees and the juvenile bees as well as low density, uh, uh, high density lipoprotein. Um, so, because of that, Varroa have this very conspicuous period in their life cycle where they will climb onto adult bees and they will remain on the body of an adult bee somewhere between three and 13 days, on average, seven days, on average, one week. They suspend their reproduction every time they go into the reproductive cycle. And as a result of that, during that time, they're not able to reproduce. That arrests their ability to expand their population size. Because the trophy mites don't do this, they don't spend that time on the adult bee population. They may spend a matter of hours outside of the cell before jumping back into a new one if there isn't one immediately available to them. Uh, as a result of that, they're able to keep their reproductive rate just continuously moving. Um, we also know that these parasites are able to transmit viruses. Deformed wing virus and acute bee paralysis have already been confirmed. And black queen cell virus seems likely based on the data that we have seen so far as well. So um, they are concerning organisms. But that's those were the matters of what we know. And you may notice it was a fairly short number of slides detailing what we know about these organisms. And the reason for that being, we don't know nearly enough about these creatures. And that's why I've been trying to sound the alarm, because it's always bad to have an issue, an ailment, a pathogen, a parasite show up when we don't know enough about it yet to actually be able to manage that effectively and properly. Um, and so I'm trying to do everything I can to learn about the life cycle of these organisms, to learn about the vulnerabilities that they have, and to learn um, what impact they have on the bees themselves so that we can do all that we can to manage it. And I'm so excited to say there are multiple teams of researchers working on this now. Uh, we have got quite a, a, a well-structured setting going now where multiple teams of researchers have been pulled into the intrigue and interest around this mite. So some of the things that we're learning um, during my time in Korea, uh, learning about trophy mites in that region, uh, the damage that they're causing, the issues there, um, I have finally gotten the opportunity to see trophy mites laying eggs regularly, collect some of these eggs. We're going to conduct some biochemical analyses to better understand the makeup of those eggs. But you might notice something odd here. Does anybody see anything weird looking at that trophy mite and its egg? You might notice that that egg is absolutely gigantic by comparison to the trophy mites. Varroa lay large eggs, um, but not to the extent that trophy lay large eggs. And it's really gotten me interested in how their biochemical processes allow them to produce all of the egg yolk necessary. Um, egg yolk is made out of these very nutritively dense 
proteins. And it requires a huge amount of energy from the female to do this. And we know that in order to do this as quickly as she's doing it, she's bypassing some rules that we've seen because the metabolic calculations are not borne out such that a female of this size should be able to produce an egg that is a substantial proportion of her body volume uh, every single day. But that's what they're doing. And if we can figure out exactly how they're doing it, we may be able to disrupt it. And so we are typically, uh, or we are already looking into this process uh, and hopefully uh, those analyses will uh, go along very smoothly in the near future. But something else that we really need to learn is uh, how we can better monitor for these organisms. One of the primary monitoring methods right now is to scratch the capping um, of these cells to kind of use a um, either a hive tool or um, maybe an uncapping fork and just scratch through the cells and then bang that frame against a pan to dislodge the mites. Now, this is a pretty messy process. While you're scraping through the cells, you're going to damage some bees. All of the goo that then comes out when you bang that frame can obscure whether there are mites present because they're all stuck and buried in goop and, and so on. And a lot of beekeepers have been reluctant to do this because of the extent to which it damages a huge amount of brood in that process. Um, so I've been... Um, working to develop a monitoring system. We are already working with the USDA uh, in Fort Collins, um, the APHIS lab up there to develop an actual assay for it where we can swab some of the hive debris um, and actually uh, look at the um, just kind of leftover DNA bits and so on and see if we can find these mites that way. But for a low cost measure of doing this, We've been taking frames out of colonies, shaking the bees off, and we're shaking specifically rather than brushing because we don't actually want to brush the mites off that are running around on the frame. We want to use them for our diagnostic. And then taking a transparency. Somebody, some of you may actually recognize this if you have been educators for a long time, but these transparencies that used to be used in classrooms for overhead projectors are actually really useful in this context. Um, we've used the same glue that's on sticky notes. And these sticky notes have uh, a kind of glue that can be stuck and restuck repeatedly. And so we press that up against the frame that has had the bees shaken off of it and then pull it off. And what you can see is that the mites will be stuck to that surface and we can count how many of them are there. We can verify that they're present inside of a colony uh, as sort of a low cost uh, monitoring system. We're currently working now to compare that to the bump method uh, and to compare that level of sensitivity um, to the 100 cell inspection method that I've been doing over the last uh, three, four years, um, opening 100 cells individually. Now that has been the most uh, accurate way of looking into these cells for a long time now, but it is incredibly time consuming to open 100 cells, especially if you're going to do that in multiple colonies and verify the presence of these mites. So hopefully this method of using the uh, transparencies will be an effective measure as well. And in addition to all of that, I've designed this system that I've been referring to the Mite Insight system. Um, and it allows us to actually peer into a sealed brood cell and see what the mites are doing inside of it. And so you're currently watching the very first video uh, ever filmed, or, or at least uh, to this extent, um, you're looking at the first video that we've actually seen of these mites inside of these brood cells that are sealed. So instead of opening the brood cells and looking in and taking pictures, we've actually replaced two of the walls of a typical hexagonal cell with um, high optical clarity glass that allows us to actually peer through. And so we take those, those half wax, half artificial like glass cells, put them into um, this incubator that is designed to have a microscope and a camera over it. And it's connected to a relay recorder that allows us to record the entire what, 10, 12, sometimes 14 day period, depending on whether we're working with drones, workers, Apis serrana. And we can actually see what the parasites are doing in real time. Now, the normal way to look into these cells and to know what's happening is to uncap the cell, peer inside, and try to understand the parasite that way. But we are trying to uh, stop using the stop motion system and really look in there and uh, figure these things out by watching a continuous stream of what's happening rather than quick bursts and then inferring what was going on before or after. We're also working to fight the mite. We really want to kill the parasite that is doing all of this damage. 
And so it's videos like these that have allowed us um, to really look at what these mites are doing um, when they're feeding on the bees. It's allowed us to understand um, certain things more clearly, like in this video right here, looking at a varroa mite feeding on Apis mellifera, you can see how it's forcing its mouth parts through the integument, through the skin of the bee. And you can see that just underneath is all of this white fat body tissue. And all of that tissue, that, that the liver of the bee itself, uh, is this food source for the mite. But we've been wondering for a while now, are the trophy mites doing the same thing? And so uh, the impact of these varroa mites feeding on this tissue is uh, there's quite a myriad of impacts that they have there, typically leading to the death of their host. But these are the things that we don't know yet about tropy and desperately need to figure out. And so you can uh, see that as we have continued this research, looking at the tropy mites, uh, we've been working on getting specifically those answers as well. Uh, we're trying to figure out what happens when they feed. We're trying to figure out what happens when there's a varroa mite and a tropy mite feeding on the same bee, whether they uh, are competing with each other, whether they don't interact much at all, whether they somehow synergize into a worse issue than the sum of their parts. We're working to answer all of those questions. Um, but we've also been working on the very practical application of different um, ways of treating these mites from applying formic acid or even utilizing heat. What we know is that we have to apply something that's going to penetrate deep into the colony and go through those capped cells. The mites are in some ways little geniuses to have jumped into these cells right before the adult bees spread a capping of wax over it because that capping is hydrophobic. And many of the pesticides that are applied uh, are typically ones that cannot get through a hydrophobic capping. But something like formic acid, as you can see here, there's a dramatic drop off immediately upon us treating. Week zero, which you see on the X axis, uh, week zero is the week before treatment. Week one is the first week of treatment. And then we continue to track this, this these data all the way out. And you can see that the population of mites drops off dramatically on week one down to zero. Um, when we used uh, the green line, the purple line are both two different applications of formic acid. And we saw almost no difference between them. But then with heat treatments, we saw this rebound in the population the next week. Uh, and then sometimes we see a drop off in the next week and then a bit of a rebound again. Uh, and it's been really interesting to us to try to understand whether the impact of heat somehow induces the mites to be more reproductive in the following weeks or what happens. But it definitely kills some. And then others seem to uh, continue on their life cycle. And so um, from these data, we can see very clearly that on week zero, there are very few mites that are just dead inside of the cells. We open 100 cells. We look at the percentage of mites that we find inside these cells. And you can see here um, from our control through to all of the rest of ours, the mites are alive before we treat. And the next week, unsurprisingly, with effective treatments, uh, one of which now being Formic Pro, we know that Formic Pro is an effective measure against these mites. We can't find a single live mite inside the cell. With liquid formic, even more interestingly, uh, with formic pro, they seem to remove the dead mites. Um, but with formic acid, um, liquid formic acid, like we were able to open a bunch of cells, see the larvae inside with the dead mite. Um, and we're working on better understanding um, the, how the different impacts between using liquid formic and formic pro. Um, and then with the heating pads, some of the mites definitely were dead by the next week, but many of them also still survived. And we're still trying to better understand um, how to utilize something like heat if it is a, a possible measure. So the Boulder Bee Lab, my lab here at the University of Colorado Boulder, is focusing on better understanding the varroa mites, which are currently impacting bees um, in much of the, the, the Western world and the tropy mite that is seems to be trying to work its way towards the Western world. Um, and I am just delighted that I get to be um, leading uh, the, the efforts with my lab, um, going over to different countries. Um, next, uh, in February, we're heading to Sri Lanka, Nepal, and the Philippines uh, to document the spread of these mites in these regions and better understand them there. Um, and then uh, later in the year, we'll be heading to Tajikistan, uh, Taiwan, and a few other locations. So thank you very much for listening. Um, and I would like to thank those who supported this research from the very beginning, we really like to thank um, um, 
Manuka Doctor, Honeyflow, and Project Apis M for their support um, financially for this work, as well as the United States Department of Agriculture and National Geographic, who have been incredible partners in getting this work done from start to finish. And if there are any questions, I would be delighted to answer them. Thank you, Dr. Ramsey. That was just fascinating. Um, there is um, some questions. Um, yeah. So... Are AAA laps consuming a bee's fat body, uh, hemolymph, in the same way that Varroa does? And I think you've addressed this. Maybe this question came in before you addressed it. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I got distracted reading one of these messages. Uh, could you ask that again? Yeah. Uh, are AAA laps consuming a bee's fat body, hemolymph, uh, in the same way as Varroa? We do not know the answer to that yet. But just given the fact that these mites are producing these huge eggs and they need a lot of nutrition to do it, and the fact that the hemolymph itself, just as a, a resource all on its own, is quite nutrient poor by comparison to things like the fat body, it really seems like they are feeding on a nutritively dense tissue. But we have not done any work thus far to confirm that. And so I can't make any pronouncements on that subject that are firm conclusions, but my money right now would be on the fat body or another nutritively dense tissue of that nature. Okay. Um, the next question, what can you tell us about tropolelap spread possibility given the recent announcements from Australia that they are giving up on fighting Varroa entry to the continent? So... When Varroa arrived in New South Wales, um, it was just kind of a, a panic uh, for a lot of people, but also for a lot of us who have been tracking the spread of these parasites, uh, it wasn't actually that surprising. Varroa mites are really good at hitching a ride, um, not just on bees, but also capitalizing on the fact that um, human beings are so closely associated with bees, and we like moving bees and bee products where these kinds of things can happen sometimes. But if you find an organism at the point of entry or near the point of entry, if it's been a very small amount of time since its incursion in your country, then that is a manageable situation where you may actually be able to eradicate it. However, if it has been there for a long period of time, it will unfortunately move into a period of establishment. And when it is established, it is very, very difficult to eradicate an organism. Um, the Australians put in some serious work. They tried to manage their population of feral bees. They tried to do everything they could to quarantine and kill colonies that were within quarantine zones. And it seemed like the parasite simply had been there too long. And that's what we want to avoid having happen with trophy mites. If we can find them at the point of entry, this is the reason why I brought back um, several samples of trophy mites. Dead, dead everybody. I'm not going to be that guy that brings back live trophy and causes all these problems. <laughs> but we brought back several trophy mites um, and put them in, uh, they're in alcohol or they're in liquid nitrogen. And our um, apiary inspectors all have uh, we're now distributing them to all of our apiary inspectors so that we have eyes and ears on the ground where if somebody sees a trophy mite, they can immediately identify it. The apiary inspectors will likely be the first people to see these kinds of things at a point of entry. And if we can find it right where it's gotten here, we can eradicate that organism very likely. But if we wait until it spreads and becomes a conspicuous issue and finally um, is identified, that's that's a losing battle, as has been shown in Australia. Mm -hmm. um there are many many questions in here. yes there are <laughs> um i'm not sure if, if you're looking at these and which ones you want to answer well there's one right at the top that um there is a beekeeper also saying that they've confirmed um tropy is in, in south russia uh, as well and uh, at this time i try to be very um circumspect about uh just kind of I don't want to throw things out there without having really good data on these things. And so um, I've been requiring before I add these things to the map that we have um, at the very least um, really good like, you know, video, um, but video can be taken anywhere and sometimes people can get confused. And so really before I add these, I like to actually see a specimen. Um, and so when people can, um, obviously alcohol specimens, things have to be dead. Um, but if someone can get a specimen through, then we can actually look at them. 
Um, I don't want to bring any of these um, into the U.S. without very clear indication that they are dead. Um, and so usually I look at these specimens in a country that already has trophy mites. And so when I do my next trip to Tajikistan, I'm going to contact some of these researchers in Russia um, who have found some of these mites. And I would like to have them sent over there so that we can look at them there and, and verify that. But yes, um, I have seen those those emails and those messages, and I really appreciate that people have been working so hard to define where these creatures are, and have been trying to get me to um, to to really show uh, in the maps and everything where they are. Mm -hmm. um, there's a question here that's interesting about um, breeding mite resistant bees, and um, and whether bees could be bred to combat uh, trophy. Um, breeding mite resistant bees is a great idea. Like I would love to have more options that don't continue to increase our reliance on chemical pesticides. Um, and so any of the things that can be a part of our integrated pest management toolbox are great for us to have. I, mm, I know I'm going to get some, uh, some sternly worded messages for this. But I would love to see us utilizing more of the tools at our disposal, including things like CRISPR, um, because there are some genes in the Asian honeybees that have been around these parasites for millions of years that would allow potentially our honeybees to better control them. And we're not going to get that through normal breeding methods. Um, that's not to say that normal breeding methods won't get us some really great stuff, but I think some of the very clearly defined methods that the other bees are using to manage them, uh, would best be added through something like CRISPR, but I know a lot of people don't like the idea of us genetically modifying our bees, and I understand the reticence, but I do hope that we start becoming a bit more comfortable with it and at least looking into the idea. Sure. Um... Are you say sure here? now, Matt, but I've gotten some uh, I've gotten some very cranky emails about that. Yeah. Um, what measures are beekeepers using in the areas where they are present? So beekeepers in areas where they're present, and um, there's a, a graduate student, I believe, from the University of Auburn, um, Rogan Tokash, who's doing some really cool research on this subject. Um, but both of us have noted that beekeepers in the area of doing have been doing some really interesting work in um, constant walkaway splits and brood breaks um, where they are removing um, the brood from a colony and just killing all of it. Um, and because of that inability for the mites to feed, since they seem to only be able to feed uh, on the brood in the colony, it kind of resets the mite levels. It, it knocks them back down to zero. The mites come back but it takes them then a while again to build up. And so it's this constant removal of brood that is one uh, very consistent method of management. The problem being, it doesn't allow your colony to get very large and it dramatically um, reduces their ability to build up to what we would think of as a contract strength colony or a, a very productive colony. Um, another thing that they're doing is soaking pieces of wood in very, very, very concentrated formic acid, 85% uh, industrial formic acid, typically used on rubber plantations. They're pushing those pieces of wood into the colony and aerosolizing formic acid that way. So that was what I was comparing to formic pro was this usage of liquid formic that I learned from beekeepers in Northern Thailand before applying it in Central Thailand. Um. Any interesting questions in here that you would like to answer? As I'm scrolling, there is just so many and yeah. um, all great uh, questions. Yeah, I'll try to do like a, a lightning round of rapid fire answers to these. So an anonymous attendee asked, were these pictures taken of trophy mites on Apis serrana or Apis mellifera? And I'll tell you that Apis serrana is incredibly good at controlling parasites. And while we have found uh, trophy mites, or while we have um, seen reports of trophy mites being present in Apis serrana colonies, we've just not seen them being overrun with these parasites or anything of that nature. I have not personally seen Apis serrana, uh, trophy mites on Apis serrana. So all of the images that you see here are trophy on Apis mellifera. Um, but the more that I work with Apis serrana in these different countries, uh, it's possible that if that is a thing, I'll, I'll start to see it then. Um, how much heat and for how long? Um, high temps 
for the entire eight weeks. Um, so Simone asked about how much heat we used in this process. So we used two different methods of heat application. And I was trying to get through that uh, pretty quickly so that I wouldn't take up too much time and get time for questions. But thank you for asking this because it's a very important clarification. Um, so the same way that we used two meth methods of uh, formic, where we used one that was um, over the course of 14 days was keeping this this uh, cloud of formic acid going in the colony. We also had the one quick burst that you get from sliding in those pieces of wood. And then the same way with the heat, we did a, a single heat treatment that heated a colony to 106 degrees Fahrenheit, about 41 degrees Celsius for 160 minutes. And then after that, we're done. No more treating. And then we just looked at the mite populations after that. Um, and then there was another method that we used that uh, unfortunately, it was just too involved for us to get really good data on it. And so the data is not statistically significant by any means. But we actually used um, uh, this proprietary system where the frame has a heating coil woven into it, where instead of pushing a heating pad into the colony and heating the entire colony to 106 degrees, the heating coil itself actually heats individual cells. And because it only has to use very little energy to do that, we were able to hook it up to a solar cell and actually um, treat every week um, where it would blast heat into these frames every single week. The uh, unfortunate part about it is we had to wait for the bees to draw a comb on it and then start raising brood on it and then for that brood to get infested. And that simply took too long. The bees took a very long time to acclimate to those frames. Uh, honestly, on uh, average, a couple of months, it took almost eight weeks for them to get used to the frames enough to start rearing brood in them. And so we just didn't have enough time for um, us to really get good data on that. But, um, and so, yeah, that, that was the system, the set of systems we were working with. Another question is what about apophar or amitraz? And amitraz is one of the most effective measures that we have against varroa mites currently. Um, and it was one that we used to say had very little resistance in our varroa mite population. We're beginning to see some now, but still it's, uh, a pretty effective measure to be used against Varroa. The problem is it's one of those chemicals that I was describing earlier that its biochemistry doesn't allow it to penetrate the cell capping. And so amitraz is a contact insecticidal treatment that impacts the nervous system of the mites. And they come in contact with it by the bees walking around, bumping into those impregnated strips of amitraz and then spreading the chemical all around the colony. And then as a varroa mite touches a bee that has some chemical on its surface or touches a surface that has amitraz on it, um, it impairs their nervous system uh, and results in them eventually becoming paralyzed and dying. Trophy mites don't spend enough time outside of the cells to be impacted by these chemicals quite substantially. And there are areas of the world where amitraz has been tried, and unfortunately, it's led to these mites developing a layer of resistance to this specific chemical because its mode of application has allowed them to be exposed to it in very small amounts during the brief period of time they leave the cell and jump into another. And so they actually have a layer of resistance now to amitraz. Um, Let's see. How many trophy mites enter a cell at one time? Oh, oh, Kathy, great question. Um, it's unfortunate, but uh, trophy mites don't seem to be as focused as varroa mites <laughs> uh, have been on avoiding overwhelming the host. There has been research that's shown that when multiple varroa mites go into the same cell, they will all modulate their um, metabolic rate so that they don't have to feed as frequently. They won't be able to have quite as many offspring, but it's better than all of them trying to feed at the same normal rate that they feed um, and then lead to the host dying and all of them being trapped inside and you know, having a fitness of zero as a result. Well, trophy mites, I mean, I have seen quite a few of them in worker brood cells. Um, and one cell um, and some of these clearly were offspring of the foundress inside the cell with them, but we counted, I think, 18 in one cell. Um, and it was, you know, entire families. So it was probably, you know, maybe four foundress mites that went in there and had a bunch of babies, but it can get pretty crazy inside of those cells. And it's, it's disturbing to watch to the extent that they can just overwhelm and kill the host. Um, Northern Australia, your opinion, when they will get Trophy mites. I do not have the sort of crystal ball where I would be able to answer that sort of question. Um, there are just too many factors at play. Northern Australia, Australia is Northern Australia is in that proximity to Southeast Asia 
um, where there are plenty of things, plenty of things that could arrive. There were the what colonies of, I believe, Apis Floria um, that each had Euveroa mites in them. And Euveroa is a totally different genus of Varroa mites that most people don't even know exists. Um, that's only present right now in Southeast Asia. And so these kinds of things can happen. It looks like they found those colonies quickly enough to, to manage that situation. But um, yeah, that's um, definitely something that could occur without warning. Um, how is liquid formic different from formic pro? Liquid formic is a much higher concentration of formic pro and is not structured in a time release sort of manner. And so it's released um, very quickly in one big burst rather than the slow release of formic pro. Uh, it seemed like the both of them just killed a ton of mites very quickly. Um, so both are effective, but the question is the impact on the brood. Uh, formic pro um, seem to have uh, likely because of the temperatures in Thailand a substantial impact on the brood itself. Um, and so there were some um, open cells where clearly larvae were lost. And that's likely why you didn't see as large a count of dead mites inside of the cells. It seemed like the bees went through and removed um, a fair number of cells that were impacted. Uh, liquid formic with its quick burst of formic acid may be uh, a way of treating that might be less damaging to the uh, to some of the at least open brood potentially, but we didn't. That wasn't what we were measuring in this study, so I can't say that um, specifically from the data. I can only say from observation. Um, and then it looks like my laptop battery is beginning to run low. Um, so if you just see me disappear. <laughs> That's the reason why, because I did not bring my charger with me. <laughs> um, yes, I did not. Um, no, one one of the, the questions that we that I posed was, um, you know, how can how can beekeepers help? And I think it's just you know sp spreading this webinar and the information that we put out there so that they can um, you know contact someone if they see trophy. Um, but maybe more importantly, not contact people a lot if they're seeing like male varroa mites, because I, I imagine mm -hmm. that that's clogging your mm -hmm. inbox. Up. Exactly. Um, that's one of the things that I would I've noticed most consistently is mixed up with tropy mites. Um, I have had people freak out, tell their entire state association that they've got tropy mites and very clear evidence of it, and then they end up sending over a video of a male. Varroa mite. And because male varroa mites are such an unusual thing, they're very, very, very rarely outside of a cell. Um, they are something that's very easy to think of as a foreign alien thing in your colony, but they're just there. So we're trying to create more um, resources to educate people about exactly what a trophy mite looks like. Um, right now, I'm trying to start like doing these presentations is one way of doing that. But with apiary inspectors, I'm trying really hard to give a very focused push to showing them trophy mites. Um, and then some work, um, I think potentially funded by Project Apis M, um, maybe. Actually, maybe I should, don't quote me on that. But um, there are people right now getting together these um, groups of, of beekeepers and apiary inspectors and researchers and showing them what trophy mites look like and doing an entire diagnostic lab um, so that more people have a consistent ability to identify them. Um, one more question, because I think it's an interesting one. Do we know if there's a climate more preferred by trophy, humid or arid, or does it not matter? Um, so there was this really interesting paper that showed up, um, I think it was the 1980s, where like the the title of the paper is literally, um, tropy mites are not something that um, people need to worry about outside of the tropics. Like, you know, tropy mites, ah, scary creatures, but don't worry, outside of the tropics, they'll never be an issue. And the idea was because um, brood can't be reared year round in most temperate regions. Uh, and so even if a tropy mite arrived in somewhere like, Canada, the long winter would disrupt their ability to survive the entire year and the winter would lead to their uh, eradication. That is not the case. While they do seem to thrive in the tropics, they seem to be able to live uh, some version of their best lives, even in uh, temperate regions. And we don't know how they're doing it. But one thing that we have noticed, and it's weird, 
they just seemed to leave the colony um, during for about four months out of the year, um, somewhere between December and April, uh, the end of December, beginning of April, no trophy mites. Don't know why, don't know what they're doing, and this typically only happens, I, I'm not sure if it only happens in temperate regions. It's been reported in temperate regions, but um, it's possible they're using an alternative host uh, or just like hibernating in the ground or something, but they're doing something. We know that in tropical regions, they seem to be at their best, and in temperate regions, their populations uh, grow more slowly. And that is the ding where my battery tells me it's about to shut this computer off. <laughs> well, Dr. Ramsey, thank you so much. I know I learned a ton um, and just really appreciated all of the, all of the, all that you were doing. Um, and um, with that, uh, have a great day and, and we will make sure that we um, circulate this video. For sure. Thank you so much. Is there a way to save the Q&A? I know that some of the people still had questions. I might be able to get yeah. back to some. Let me let me do that. Let me Thank you.